and Fernando and Howard for those important words. And as I said at the beginning of this webinar, in case you joined us late, um, this is a webinar of Disability Vo Vote California, which is a statewide coalition of organizations and individuals in the disability community across disabilities um, that believe that it is really important to educate each other about why we should be voting, how we should think about candidates and issues from the perspective of people with disabilities, family members and professionals. And we will be hosting a series of webinars every week, candidate forums, um, as well as um, lots of other activities. We're gonna be doing phone banking and already a ton of materials have, are out there. If you'd like to find out more about our coalition, um, you can go to disabilityvoteca.org disabilityvoteca.org and you can also join our coalition by going to by going on the chat or going in Facebook and putting the name of the organization that would like to join the coalition and an email address where we can contact you. So with that we're going to get started with the meat of our webinar today and I would really like to thank Paul Spencer and Fred Neeson who are who come today to educate us on on disability voters and what their rights are to accessibility, what their rights are um, to various ways to get information about voting. Um, and we hope that this information that they will be providing are, is information that all of you who are watching can share with others as well. So I wanna thank you, Paul and Fred, and take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Spencer. I'm an attorney with Disability Rights California and our Voting Rights Practice Group. And I'm here presenting uh, with Fred, who is our, you want to introduce yourself, Fred? Oh, you're muted, sir. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So uh, thanks everyone for having us present. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up our PowerPoint. Hopefully this works. Sorry, going to full screen there. All right. Um, so if Judy gives me a thumbs up, I'll know that the PowerPoint's working. All right, I got two thumbs up. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we're gonna talk about accessible voting in California and also do a COVID-19 update because it's changed a lot of things. So, um, so, so, you know, here's our agenda. You know, we're, we're gonna talk about November. Um, I think everyone's got a lot of questions for how the November election's gonna work. Um, and we also really want to talk about, you know, what are the rules and requirements for accessible voting? You know, the basics. You know, we, we really want everyone to be, to understand what the rules are, what the protections folks have, and, you know, to be able to answer basic questions if you're an advocate. Um, you know, we'll briefly talk about voting accessibility advisory committee as a way to get involved. Um, and then uh, Fred's going to talk about remote accessible vote by mail, and then also the rules for voting um, in conservatorships. But, um, before we kind of jumped into the presentation, uh, you know, Fred and I, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, what Disability Rights California does and, you know, what our work is statewide. Um, so, you know, our voting rights practice group works in the entire state, which is 58 counties. Um, you know, we, we really want to make sure that voting is accessible for all voters statewide. And, you know, between Fred and I and our colleagues, you know, we've done in-person advocacy in the last few years in probably over 40 of the counties. I mean, that's in-person advocacy. So we, so we really do try to cover some ground. Uh, COVID has changed some of our plans. You know, we are working remotely now. But, you know, just to give you an idea of some of the work we do, like we do poll worker trainings. Uh, this is me in Inyo County in uh, 2018, giving a poll worker training to their poll workers. You know, Inyo is a smaller county. So, you know, this is probably about 50% of their poll workers, which I'm talking to right now. Um, in bigger counties, you know, we'll talk to the trainers of the poll worker trainers. But you know, we do uh, poll worker training. Um, we do, you know, advocacy on the state level. This is Fred uh, with Secretary of State Alex Padilla. I think Fred's getting an award here. 
Um, Fred's also. Well, I'm being, I'm being the back. Yeah, that's right. You're getting an award from the back. You know, Fred's also on the the state um, voting accessibility advisory committee. So, you know, sometimes we're getting awards from Secretary Badia. Sometimes it's uh, a little more contentious with litigation and other things going on. But you know, we're always working to make sure elections are accessible. But um, it's a good photo. Uh, you know, we do a lot of education and outreach work. This is a, a picture from one of the videos we were filming for YouTube on accessible voting. So on our YouTube channel, you can see a lot of the videos we've made. Um, we, we also do a lot of um, in-person education and outreach for people with disabilities. We speak to different, to different organizations around the state. We do lots of webinars. So we are here to do education and outreach. And we're also flexible with COVID-19. You know, we, we really work to make sure that voting equipment is accessible for people with disabilities. And this is our colleague, Gabe Taylor in Los Angeles. So, you know, LA County needed to test out some of their new voting equipment because of COVID. They couldn't have, um, you know, the, the usual testing procedures. So they actually brought equipment to Gabe's house in LA. And this is him testing out the equipment and reviewing some of the accessibility. So, you know, this is, really isn't all the work we do, but I, I kind of want to give you a few pictures to kind of give you an idea of what the Voting Rights Practice Group does um, in California. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's new for 2020, even without COVID in the elections context, a lot of that, it sort of impacts people with disabilities. Um, so, and we're gonna talk about all this stuff in the presentation, but, but, but it's a lot. So, I mean, even without COVID, there were quite a few things that were changing, but then again, there's lots of stuff that's kind of always been the law of the land that makes elections accessible for people with disabilities. You know, we, we will talk about conditional voter registration, remote accessible vote by mail, what the Voters' Choice Act is, um, and then the COVID-19 related adjustments, for lack of a better term, for November. So, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but it, there is going to be accessible in-person voting for November. You know, it's something Fred and I and our colleagues, we've really been advocating hard to make sure that anything that was changed for November, it still incorporated the needs of voters with disabilities and that things were accessible. Um, so, you know, just some stuff for, for COVID-19, you know, the big thing is all registered active voters in California are going to be sent to vote by mail ballot automatically. So that, that's a lot of people that are going to get a ballot in the mail for the first time. Um, you know, for some people that'll work, but you know, uh, some people need to vote in person. It, some for it's a preference, but for people with disabilities, a lot of people with disabilities need to be able to vote in person so they can do it privately and independently by using an accessible voting machine, for example. So the good news is, is that um, across the state, there is gonna be accessible in-person voting in every county. There's a few exceptions, which we'll talk about for, for the 99% of the population, you're gonna have in-person voting options. How it works by county, uh, bear with me, it, it gets a little confusing, but um, so in the Voters' Choice Act counties that do the Voters' Choice Act, it's about 15 counties. They're gonna have their four day vote centers are still gonna be open. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to vote at any vote center in the county if you live in one of those Voters' Choice Act counties. So counties are, so besides the Voters' Choice Act counties, counties are still sort of deciding, you know, they're in crunch time right now, but, but how they're gonna offer in-person voting in November and they have some options. So one option is they can just stick with traditional polling places. And, and there's about 14 or 15 counties that are planning on doing that. So, you know, if you live in a Voters' Choice Act County or a lot of these the counties are gonna go with the traditional polling place, your, your in-person options really aren't gonna change much. It'll, it'll be the same with some PPE and social distancing stuff, which we'll talk about. Um, so about 15 to 20 counties are planning on doing super consolidated polling places. Basically, it's a polling location that's going to be open for four days, and it'll serve 10,000 voters. Typically, a polling location serves around 1,000-ish voters. So um, they do have a lot of accessibility. But anyway, there's some counties that are doing that. There are three really small counties that are already all vote by mail. Um, if you live in Alpine, Plumas, or Sierra, great. There's, there's only a handful of you in the state that live there. And if you have questions about how accessibility works there, you know, please feel free to contact Fred and I. You know, we've been to those counties, we've been advocating them. There are accessible options in there, but, but again, there's very few voters that live in those counties. Um, and then there's probably about four or five counties that are still undecided and figuring it out. So 
counties are really, they're in a crunch. A lot of counties are in crunch time right now trying to get these locations secured. Um, you know, one thing Fred and I do, you know, we counties have to post election plans for voters choice at counties. So, you know, we, we're commenting to make sure that they are meeting the needs of voters with disabilities, they're complying with the law. So you know, we're commenting on letters. One cool tool, which I have a screenshot up here, is the um, Center for Inclusive Democracy. They have this really great tool where you can look up voting locations, and now it's for every county in the state. So like, for example, like right now, I have the, the percent dis disabled population highlighted for LA County. So you can see kind of where you might want a, a higher concentration of vote center locations. Um, so, so this is a really powerful tool for advocates, and I encourage folks to look at it. Um, and especially for the Voters Choice Act counties, there's a public comment period. And for counties doing the super consolidated polling places, they also are going to have a public comments period on their locations. So it is something that, that advocates of people with disabilities can, you know, they, they have an opportunity to be heard about where these locations are. But um, you know, right now, you know, we're, we're writing a lot of letters and, you know, in the past there were public hearings. There's, there's not hearings this time around. But um, that, that's another thing we were doing is, is testifying at these public hearings. But anyway, it's Center for Inclusive Democracy. They also have some cool tools out. It's free. Um, and it, it, I think it's pretty user friendly. So um, let's jump into the accessible voting requirements. So we're kind of going back a little bit to the basics here, but I will be um, adding in when we get to things that relate to uh, COVID and how that might change things a little bit. So, I mean, this is like kind of, the, this is the, the blanket rule here, you know, a private and independent ballot is everyone's right. So, you know, that, that's state and federal law in California. and. Um, you know, we'll kind of go over the ways that that that, that right is protected. Um, so, you know, Help America Vote Act, locations uh, are physically accessible and paths of travel into the locations and that they all have accessible voting systems. Um, so that's the Help America Vote Act. This is a screenshot of the guidance the Secretary of State has put out for setting up vote center locations for November. So the good news is they've got a, a pretty comprehensive document for guidance on, you know, how to make locations safe. And, and also, you know, this protects accessibility too. You can see by the spacing, you know, there's plenty of path of travel. You know, one, one weird thing in this screenshot is, you know, if this is a super consolidated polling place, it should have three accessible voting systems. But, but anyway, my, my point, the reason I include this is there, there is some pretty good, there's good information from the California Secretary of State out right now for guidance for counties. So it's great. So it's, it's nice and supportive. And also, you know, voting rights advocates, and Fred and I included, you know, we participated in a working group with the California Secretary of State that met in March and April of this year to really sort of try to find a consensus on details for November. And you know, some productive stuff came out of that working group. Um, and, you, you know, for example, like really encouraging not just sending all voters to by mail ballot, but also making sure that in-person voting is available in California. And, you know, Fred and I, we think that's really important to keep voting accessible so you have access to an accessible voting system. Um, so for the accessible voting system, there's one in every polling location in California. It has to be there. Um, so this allows people with disabilities to vote privately and independently. Um, you know, if you haven't seen an accessible voting system, you know, you, you can check them out online. You know, we have some videos on our website. You, you can see people using them. Um, there's only three or four different systems that are used in the state so you can figure out which kind your county is using. I do encourage you, you know, if you intend to use the accessible voting system, if you can, if you have time, check it out online ahead of time to watch a YouTube video on the system. They're, they're pretty user friendly. Some of them kind of look like big iPads and they have, you know, AT capabilities. Um, they've been vetted by people with disabilities in the Secretary of State. Um, so I, I do really encourage you to use them. Again, they're at every location. for. Um, for vote centers and super consolidated polling places, they're actually gonna have three of these, which is great. Because you know, one issue Fred and I see in our advocacy work, you know, we run a hotline on election day too, I didn't mention, you know, we get calls from voters who, the, this is in the past, typically the machine would be broken or poll workers didn't know how to use it. Um, and part of that was that there was pretty old equipment being used statewide. The good news is as of last year, all counties have been required to update their equipment. So. Also as a voter with a disability, when you, know, when you walk into your polling location, if, if you didn't vote in person in March, you, know, you might very well see new voting equipment um, at your voting location, which is great. So the advantage of the new equipment is it's less buggy, 
it's easier for poll workers to troubleshoot. And I, I just think it, it's more intuitive to use as a voter, like especially if you're you know, used to using an iPad, these new systems are pretty good. So it's really great to see new equipment statewide. And you know, Fred and I, we did see a, a drop in our hotline calls in March from people that were having problems with the accessible voting equipment. So I'm hoping to see that again in November, that would be a really good sign that the new equipment um, is, is working better for people with disabilities. So like I said, with the Secretary of State's guidance, you know, one thing I like to see in this is like really detailed cleaning protocols for each type of voting equipment. So, you know, when you do go vote in person, there's, there's gonna be PPE, there'll be masks available. Um, the equipment will be cleaned. This is nice that, you know, they even buy the different types of voting equipment, they've specified the cleaning products, which is something I like to see that that's, that's good attention to detail. You know, you want to make sure that you know hand sanitizer isn't going to jam up all the voting equipment in the state. So, a lot of these details are being addressed, which is great. This document's online on the Secretary of State's website. It, it's a good resource too for information. Um, also, Disability Rights California. We've got lots of voting publications, which Fred and I will highlight in this presentation. Um, so, this is just some other um, things to know for voting. It's like you know, a voter with disability, you can bring someone to assist you with voting. You know, ideally, we would hope that you would be voting privately and independently so someone wasn't seeing your ballot or, you know, you're using accessible voting equipment. But if you want assistance, you can use it. Um, also, curbside voting is available. So curbside voting is, I think, kind of an underutilized feature of accessibility. You know, it's not very well known, but I, I think curbside voting might be a very popular option for November. You know, this is socially distanced especially if you're immunocompromised, it would mean you wouldn't have to go into a crowded polling location. So the way a curbside voting works is they'll have a cell phone number available that you can call when you pull up on a sign, or they might have a doorbell type device and they'll bring out um, a ballot to you. There are some issues with whether or not accessible voting equipment can be brought out, but those are some issues we're, we're working through. But curbside voting is an option, you know, especially, you know, if, if you're a person with a disability that if it's difficult to get in and out of a car, this, this might be an option for you to be able to go vote in person and you know, save some time. So it, it, it is an option and it's something that all counties are gonna be offering for November. So it, it, it's something to keep in your back pocket as another option. Um, these are just some things from the election code. You, know, you, you can bring people to assist you, but you can't bring your employer or a member of your union um, or an agent of your employer. So. Um, and that you, you can't bring more than two people with you to vote in person, but, but you can bring someone with you. Um, so uh, just big step is uh, registering to vote. Um, so you can register to vote online in California right now. 16 and 17 year olds can pre-register. Um, and then when you turn 18, you're automatic, you'll, you'll be registered. When you go to the DMV, you can be registered you're gonna be offered a voter registration opportunity. One thing to look for at the DMV is the Voting Rights Practice Group got the California DMV to install accessible computers in all the field offices in the state, uh, which is great. We're really excited about that. Before that, there really was no accessible option if you're going through a transaction at the DMV. Um, and you know, the DMV has to offer you a voter registration opportunity. So it's really nice to have that on the accessible computers. Um, and also just don't forget there, like the DMV has to offer voter registration, state funded agencies that primarily serve people with disabilities and public assistance offices, they also have to offer voter registration. So, you know, if you're accessing these services, you should be getting a voter registration opportunity um, when you sign up, when you renew, or when you change your address. Also, if you're an advocate that works with some of these organizations, you know, it's, I like to ask them, as part of my job, so I'm making sure that the voter registration is actually happening, but this is another way that we try to make sure voter registration opportunities are equitably distributed across California. Um, so let, let's talk about November. Um, election day is November 3rd. There is a voter registration deadline. This is where we're gonna talk about conditional voter registration. So, so things, it's not weird here, but it, um, bear with me. So the deadline to register to vote is October 19th. Um, if you're doing that by mail, it has to be postmarked by the 19th. However, if you miss that deadline, you can still do what's called conditional voter registration. So it's the safety net. You can go register in person um, at your county elections office, at a polling location or a vote center, and you can do that up to election day. So you know, if you miss the voter registration deadline, you can still vote. 
However, you know, especially for advocates and when you're telling your friends, you want to make sure that people are registered to vote because you're getting the mail, you're going to get your vote by mail ballot on time. There's a lot of advantages to being registered to vote, especially, you know, you want to be registered well ahead of this deadline too. Um, there's some well publicized issues with the U.S. Postal Service right now, you know, it's, it's probably advisable to try to get your ballot turned in ahead of time. You also probably don't want to be mailing your vote by mail ballot. You, you probably don't want to be registering to vote on October 19th by mail. You can, but ideally you would do that soon. Let's say you're already registered to vote and you just tuned me out for the last minute, which is fine. But what I would like you to do is still go online and check your address to make sure it's up to date. That's, that's really important, especially if you're not already a permanent vote by mail voter um you know you you might not have realized that you have an old address on file so you really want to go check and make sure that your your voter registration information is up to date you can do it on the secretary of state's website it's, it's pretty easy um, so e even if you're already registered it's definitely worth checking out there's no problem with re-registering a vote for example if you weren't sure and, and you register again it, it's fine um, so, so you can do that too this is the last thing you just kind of want to talk about. This is called the emergency medical ballot procedure. I'm hoping, oh, sorry, I don't know if you guys can see that. Just check in the chat there. If there are questions, you know, feel free to interrupt me because I, I can't really access the chat while I'm doing the PowerPoint. Yeah, um, actually, you know what I forgot to do? So I'm going to sure. take a moment. I forgot to tell people the best way to ask questions, which is not in the chat because the chat is constantly moving. So for those of you who want to ask questions, you should do it through the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. It has two little chat bubbles on it and it says Q&A. If you put your questions in there, it's able, I'm able to see it much easier. Let's, let's leave the chat for people sharing information and um, it, questions about the technology of Zoom, as well as if you wanna sign up to be part of our coalition. So for those, I know I've seen already several questions come in on the chat. Um, if you wanna move that into the Q&A, that's great. If not, I have noted that, but from now on, I'm only gonna be checking the Q&A. Thanks, Paul. Okay, great. Uh, so the, this next slide, this is the emergency medical ballot. So I have a screenshot up here of our toolkit, um, which is the, how can I vote? You know, if I can't vote in person due to a medical emergency, that, that this is a screenshot of our toolkit. And then also we have a screenshot of the California late vote by mail application, which is available online. I apologize, I forgot to narrate the photographs earlier. But um, so, so, I mean, these are the images that we have, that I have up on the screen. So what is the emergency medical ballot? This allows you, so the, the typical example is that you get hospitalized on election day. Um, you either weren't a vote by mail voter or you know you got lost you lost the ballot like what do you do so there is a process here where you can request an emergency medical ballot um, and you can get a ballot brought to you you can vote it and then someone can turn it back in for you the practical reality of this process is it's it's cumbersome and, and time intensive and, and you very well might not have time to pull it off so this is sort of a last resort kind of situation, but you know, if someone finds themselves in a hospital or, or something like that, that there is a way to, to get a ballot. But the one nice thing is, you know, this is some good advocacy from Fred has really pushed the, the state to put a standard form on their website. Like I, I know this sounds like something that's pretty basic, but there really wasn't a standard form. It varied by county. And this just added extra time to the process because you'd have to find the form or you'd have to write one out yourself in a hospital, sign it, have someone deliver it to the county elections office, pick up your ballot, bring it back to you so you can vote it, and then that person needs to take it back to a polling location or the county elections office to drop it off. If that sounds like a lot of steps, it is. But, but it is possible to pull off. So, but the one advantage though of having this standard form is a lot of times hospitals will have these forms on hand now. So if, if you are in a hospital, you, you, know, you can ask their patient services representative, they might have these forms, or you, know, you can just print one out off the internet. You don't have to, find it on the county's website if they have one. There is this standard form now, which is great. Um, and we also have a toolkit on our website, which kind of explains the steps. Also, you know, if you're having a problem voting on election day or even before election day, please call the Disability Rights California's election hotline. Our hotline is actually up year round um, and, you, and we have it staffed all the time. And, you know, we obviously staff up on election day and the time leading to the election. But, you know, we've actually been getting more and more calls in the month before elections, you know, especially if you have some issues 
related to vote by mail. You know, our hotline is for people with disabilities that are having an issue voting due to a disability. But you know, we but so you know, but please keep our number in mind. I'll, our phone number is in a lot of county voter information guides too, so that's great as well. Um, oop, see if I can go to the next slide here. Ah, okay. So uh, this is just another just in the in the, the toolkit of voting is like you know. How do you access information for what to vote for? Um, you know, Disability Vote California is also going to put out some resources for you know, basically voter guides. You know, easy to access information, easy to understand. Um, but you know, I always like to remind people you don't have to memorize all your choices for voting. This is especially useful for first-time voters, uh, people that have never voted before. You know, I, for people that vote all the time, you're like, yeah, of course I didn't memorize all my choices. You know, I, I brought a cheat sheet, I brought materials with me. But you know, that's Kind of one of those things especially first-time voters don't realize um you know that you could have this information filled out ahead of time one thing if you vote by mail you can do this at home at your own pace which is an advantage but you know like i said some people with disabilities are going to want to vote in person to be able to use accessible voting equipment or, or get other assistance um, so you can bring information with you you know this is a list of some resources uh my favorite is the easy voter guide i really like that one's put out for the league of women voters all these are really good um, and then you know some of these you can actually put in your address and it'll help you figure out what exactly is on your ballot um but but again i, I really like the easy voter guide so that's resources um the last thing i want to talk about before I, I turn it over to fred to talk about uh remote accessible vote by mail and conservatorships is voting accessibility advisory committees so it, it's sort of a long word there but we call them facts b-a-a-c um so VACs are, there's a state VAC, which Fred is on, um, that, that you know, meets in Sacramento, or now I guess it meets remotely. But, um, but then there's also VACs at the county level. So you know, if, if you liked what I've been talking about, or you're, like, you're sort of interested in election planning and you'd like to do something collaborative um, with your county election officials, um, you, know, you might consider joining one of these VACs. Um, they're required in the Voters' Choice Act County. So there's 15 counties where they're required. The rest of the counties is optional, but, but they're in about 30 counties, a little less than 30. Um, you know, if you're curious, if you haven't heard, you know, you can check your county elections website, but you know, also feel free to reach out to, to Fred and myself and, and we can point you in the right direction if you're interested in joining a VAC. Also, if you're in a county without a VAC, you know, yeah, you could be the person to start it. And we have toolkits on our website that can hide, help you jumpstart how to start uh, a VAC. These are a, a really interesting thing. You know, you literally sit around a table with your county election officials and you talk about ways to make elections more accessible. So um, it, it, it's definitely a, a really interesting feature of, of that, that a lot of counties offer. So we really encourage folks to join them. Fred and I are in a number of acts. Like I said, Fred's on the state back. Um, so th that's what I had about backs. Now I'm actually gonna um, turn it over to Fred to talk about um, uh, remote accessible vote by mail and conservatorships. Yeah. Uh, sure. Vote by mail. Oh, 
Oh, did you want some life? Yes, so, so uh, sure. So, you know, this is an option for all voters in November, which is unusual just because usually it's just for voters with disabilities, but this is an option for all voters. Um, you know, it, it allows you to uh, vote about at home using your own accessible tech. Um, and then just the last point is that the remote accessible vote by mail ballot comes, you're, you're supposed to use the, the prepaid envelope that your county election office sends you. That's the best way to go. Because like as Fred said, it's, it's got special markings on it. It's, it's faster for the county to process. But, you know, if you lose that envelope, there, there are ways that you can mail it back in. You might want to call your county elections office or call our hotline and they can talk you through the process. But try not to lose the, the, the special envelope. But if you do lose it, um, they're, not all hope is lost. How about that? Right. Uh, are you ready for the next slide? Yes. Nope. Yeah, I'm trying. Hold on. Because I'm, oh. I'm failing at the buttons here. Let's see. Oh, there we go. We have a video on YouTube page demonstrates about I think sometimes we struggle to explain what remote accessible vote by mail is, but it's just easy when you see it in this video. You're like, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, anyway, it, folks are welcome to use this video, put it on your website. We've got, it's on some county elections websites, but uh, you're welcome to use these YouTube videos. And that's actually one of our colleagues, Scott, who volunteered to be our actor for the video, which we really appreciate. So the, you know, you, you know, there, there's multiple ways to request a remote accessible vote by mail ballot. A little bit of it depends by the county, but ideally your county has it on their elections website. 
Um, and then once you get it, you know, they're, they're going to email you a link that you can open up the remote accessible vote by mail portal. Um, and I, I think Fred's going to explain next why that's not internet voting. I don't get ahead of ourselves a little bit, but you're, you know, you're going to uh, open up the email link. Yeah. the return instructions are really important, especially the sign the ballot part. Um, yeah. if, if I could add, so, you know, it, this is different for November that remote accessible vote by mail, you know, all voters can use it, not just people with disabilities. So, you know, Fred uh, and I, you know, we were, when we were working with the Secretary of State's working group, when, when this idea was floating, you know, we were really, you know, we talked to election vendors and county election officials to make sure that, you know, the increased usage wouldn't impact access for people with disabilities. And you know, from the from our research and our conversations, it, it shouldn't. So, you know, we, we were confident that the remote accessible vote by mail system will still have plenty of capacity for people with disabilities, even if people without disabilities are using it. So um, so rest assured, you know, it, it, it should work. And and really, you know, Fred and I know, like remote accessible vote by mail, it's been available. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's not widely used right now. So you know, we're hoping more people with disabilities start using it. Um, but but also, you know, the scenarios where people without disabilities are going to be using remote accessible mobile mail are probably pretty narrow. But it, this does this is sort of another tool in the tool chest for county election officials to, um, especially in unique situations like when I was talking about emergency medical ballots. Um, you know, if you're in crunch time, you know, polls are about to close, this might be a way you could get someone a ballot in time. So it does sort of make sense to try to expand the usage just for November, given the unique challenges that we're going to face doing an election under a pandemic. Um, and also just the logistical concerns of getting everyone a vote by mail ballot. So anyway, remote accessible vote by mail it should have plenty of, ac it, there's not going to be access issues for people with disabilities, but it is also something that's open for other people's. One thing that makes it a little hard though, is how you do education and outreach explaining what remote accessible vote by mail is. Right. But because whatever they say the reasonable accommodation for vote by mail. But that doesn't help them to just us, but now we can't say that. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I don't know, I, I guess in some ways this presentation, we really sort of focus on what remote accessible vote by mail is. We don't, we don't talk about the why a whole lot, but, but I guess, I, I don't know, Fred, should we take a little break and talk about why, why we have remote I will do. Yeah, so just, you know, the why here is that vote by mail is not accessible, like a, a vote, paper vote by mail ballot. So remote accessible vote by mail allows, some people so would allow you to vote privately and independently at home. But not people realize this. Yeah, and I guess, you know, Fred and I kind of, we run into this in our work that people will be like, oh, you know, people with disabilities should just use vote by mail ballots. You know, like they don't, they don't really think about it any deeper than that. But, you know, Fred and I, that we explain, you know, it, it's not, it's not an ideal situation to have to tell, you know, your roommate or a loved one how you're voting on something. It's private. Like, if they're helping you fill out the paper ballot, it's, it's, it's fixed. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Fred, he, Fred's got personal experience with this. Like, you know, he can tell some funny stories about like weird situations he's been in when he's had people helping him with a vote by mail ballot in the past because, you know, Fred, we're election attorneys and we're working on election day. So like, we can't really go to a polling place necessarily for running our yeah. hotlines. So Fred would find himself in some weird situations you know, doing vote by mail in the past. So remote accessible vote by mail has been, it's a really cool way you can vote privately and independently at home. So, um, and you know, sometimes we, we take a break and we tell those stories if we're not getting through and people are like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I wouldn't want to have to tell my mom how yeah. I was done, you know? So, um, so that's sort of the why. I guess in some ways we've kind of, since remote accessible vote by mail has been adopted statewide, we've kind of, I guess we've gotten less into the why because we're not really advocating for counties to have it, but but I guess we are still trying to explain to people what it is and and, and why it's important, I guess. But but let's let's keep going for with how it works. Um,
yeah, that that's one thing for November that the it can actually get there up to 17 days after the election. So it's not three days. So it's great that that's been extended. However, you still have to have your ballot postmarked by election day. Um, uh, um, um, no. The mail won't get it up after the afternoon. So you really want to be careful here for this election that you get your mail postmarked on time. Like, you, yeah. for example, you wouldn't want to put your completed ballot in a blue mailbox that doesn't have another pickup time for the rest of the day on November 3rd. Like, it's not going to get postmarked in time. Um, so it's really critical that, that you, get, you get your ballot postmarked before or on election day. One thing, you know, we, we've heard some advocates recommending is if you're not sure what's going to happen is to actually take it into a post office and get the round stamp. And they'll actually stamp the postmark date on there. Another option is you can just drop your ballot off at a polling location or a vote center and you know it made it in on time. Yeah. Um, and if I could just back up one thing in the presentation, some of you, especially uh, younger folks tuning in, you'll see you have to have a printer to make access remote accessible vote by mail work. And, you know, lots of people don't have printers, especially, you know, younger folks don't really have printers anymore. So, you know, this is, you know, one Achilles heel in the remote accessible vote by mail system is you have to have a printer to be able to mail, print this out. So, yes, you have to have a printer. Um, and don't forget to sign the envelope. It's really important. You got to sign. There are some protections in play. If you forget it, the county will follow up with you, but it's just a lot better to make sure that it's signed. The envelopes actually have a punch hole in them, so you can feel where, the, where your signature should go. For example, if you were blind or low vision, you, that helps you locate where the signature line is. Um, also, you know, if, if you're some without disability, the advantage of that punch hole is when you look in your envelope, you can actually make sure you remember to put the paper in the envelope. Um, but the punch hole is also really primarily there to help you line up your signature. Um, so for the next slide. Oh, Fred, are you ready to do voting under conservatorship? <laughs> or, did, or did you have more for? Okay. <laughs> makes this decision and the not in prison or on parole for a felony. So it's Prop 17, which is going to be on the ballot, which would allow people on parole to be able to vote. So things might change, but, but not for this election. But, but I, I think especially is, is for advocates and when you meet people, you know, it's to make sure, especially that you're countering the misconception that if for some reason you have a felony, you can't vote. You know, the rules are really simple. Once you finish prison and parole, you're eligible to vote. Um, I also think the mentally incompetent stuff is simple too, after Fred and I do a great job of explaining what it is, but it, it's, it's a little more to unpack. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah. It, it has a 
has gotten easier, I guess. <laughs> so, sort of. <laughs> Maybe four years ago. Yeah, it's probably actually four now, you're right. But oh my standard like it's it's a it's like a na- so in some way it's just to translate like this is like a national best practice like if you're gonna set this voting rights standard this is a really good way to do it because it um you know this makes this makes it a lot less likely someone would lose the right to vote so this is a good standard in, in some ways um Better than what we had. Better than what we had, which used to, you know, 
you know, if you couldn't fill out a voter registration affidavit, you might have lost your mm. right to vote. And it's problematic in a lot of ways. So this is a much better standard. If you Because, you know, that, that would indicate that you could communicate in a, that you're communicating a desire to participate in the voting process. So, I mean, you're technically meeting the standard there. So for that last point, that is sort of a, a common misconception we run into, you know, conservators, you know, it, it's not their call whether or not the conservative can vote, it's the judge's decision. So that, I think that's really important. You know, if you're a client of the regional center, they might know, um, you can check with your county elections office. But then the other way, the easiest way to look at it, if you are under conservative, is to actually just check your conservatorship paperwork. And if the box isn't checked for, for voting, if it's unchecked, you're you're good to go. You could vote. You're eligible because the judge did not, you know, deem you to be mentally incompetent. So it, it's pretty straightforward on the paperwork. It is one way to look at it. Um, so. So the timing is important here because the rules did change in, in 2016. So, you know, if you were conserved before that, um, you know, you might've been conserved under a different standard. So, um, you know, 
So, so how do you get the right to vote back? So there's the fast way and the in the slow way. The, the fast way is you could send a letter to the court asking to have your voting rights reinstated. And it, actually, in a toolkit we have on our website, we have a sample letter you could send to the court. The other way it works is, you know, court investigators are coming out periodically to review your conservatorship. And if your voting rights were taken away in the past, the court investigator is supposed to reevaluate your desire to vote and, you know, applying that same standard that the court applies. And, you know, if, if they think that you are able to express a desire of voting, they, they'll refer it to the court to review your voting rights. And, you know, in some of the research Fred and I have done, you know, we've been checking how this implementation of law is going in. And we have seen some cases where, you know, someone didn't have, they got conserved, you know, in the early 2000s, had the right to vote taken away. But now as their case has been periodically reviewed and, you know, they've applied the new standard to the case, the judge has reinstated the voting rights. So we have seen some cases where it's worked. You know, if, if there's a situation where it's not working or if you have any problems, you know, please contact us. We'd, we'd be happy to help you with this problem. But the good news is, is that, you know, in some of the research I've been doing recently is that I have seen some situations where what is supposed to happen is happening, which is great. Because it's because, you know, the old standard was was too much. I mean, you could really lose your right to vote when you shouldn't have. So it's good that the new standard exists and that it's also being applied and people are getting the right to vote back. Um, so this is the court invest. This this is more on the, the slow way. You know, they they really only come out every other year. So. screenshot of our toolkit next too. Yeah. yeah, so this is our toolkit that, that goes through everything Fred and I just talked about and then also includes the sample letter you can send to a county election official and that it even has the addresses for the, the probate courts in, in every county. So yeah. it, it should get you there. You know, if you get stuck or have questions, please feel free to reach out to, to DRC for assistance. But you know, this is a good DIY toolkit and it also helps explain the issue especially if, if you were a little fuzzy on some of the details. It's in here. Yeah that, that's yeah so um, I, I think we're ready to answer some questions now. I, I saw some coming up in the Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you both. Thank you Paul and Fred and DRC. Um, so let me, um, first there were some in the chat um, that I want to get to uh, since they can 
we should have them first. Um, let me see where I put them. There they are. Okay. Um, will you be talking, here's from somebody, will you be talking about how voting varies between different cities and counties? I know for LA County, we have those voting machines, but there are also, there's also voting by mail and in different cities is there traditional paper ballots. Has anything changed recently in California or does voting still vary depending on county? Uh, I, I think I can take this one. So let's just talk about LA first because it's kind of unique. So LA, when you walk into voting person in LA now, you're gonna see 10 to 50 voting machines. Or, but basically those are all accessible. So they're, they're all accessible voting machines, which is good. It gives you lots of options and it's electronic. So in LA County, everyone's voting electronically. Um, in most counties in the state, in really all other counties, when you walk in, you're, you have an option between a paper ballot and using the accessible voting system. So for, for the most states, or excuse me, for most counties, it's a, it, it's a paper ballot with, with an option to use the accessible voting system. So, so you can use either. <laughs> So that's what, when I say accessible voting machine, what it really is, it's a ballot marking device. It's basically uh, a, a fancy pen is another right. way to think about it. Like it's, it's marking a paper ballot. You know, there's accessible tech where you're using with an electronic interface, but really what it's doing is it's marking a paper ballot. And then that's what's used to see how you voted when, when the county's running the ballot. So you're not it's not storing your vote electronically or transmitting it electronically. No. Um, so it really is a ballot marking device. I think we just say accessible voting machine because it's a little easier, but it is sort of misleading because it's not internet voting. You're not voting electronically. It's not storing your votes electronically in California. So nowhere in California do they actually have voting because I, I moved here from Virginia where you actually press buttons on a screen. So nowhere in California you, do they have that? In LA, they do like you, you are pressing buttons on a screen, but then it's printing out a ballot, and then that's what's used. It's, it's all printed ballots, which are then scanned by the county. Um, and then in, in most counties in California, the majority of people are voting on a paper ballot, but their, their ballot marking device does the same thing as, as the LA's device. Yeah, it's required to have a paper ballot and then but but the accessible voting machines they, they have to have a paper trail like they 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 print a paper ballot that that's what's used to to record your vote okay all right on to the next question which which actually affects my family um, this questioner says, my daughter is 41 and always votes absentee. Her signature is very abstract and not always the same. I am afraid from what we've been seeing with how they toss ballots, if there are any questions, what should we do? I have the same thing. I have to tell you when my son turned 18 and registered to vote, his handwriting looks like a child did it. And so they rejected his voter registration and it, we had to track it down. It was right before presidential election. It became a big stress for us. So, I mean, how, how do we how do we deal with that? You want to take this one, Fred? Um, okay. Maybe I'll talk about the matching. But do you want to talk about this, the practical, like how to get the right signature on file? Yeah, I was about it. But one thing that you can do is get signature stamp. You get a signature stamp. That. But to do that, you have to register. Hey. Oh. 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 Oh.
that DMV signature is what is likely the signature your county elections office is going to have on file that they're comparing with your vote by mail ballot. So one way to look at it is to actually look at the signature that's on your driver's license or your state ID card and try to make sure that your signature looks similar to that when you sign your vote by mail ballot. Yeah, so re-registering to vote might be a good option too, especially if your signature has just changed over time and that happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. So is to make sure you've got an up-to-date signature on file. So you, you can do that. You can re-register to vote and then they'd have your up-to-date signature. Um, but just real quick for the signature, mismatching it is an issue in California. And it's something Fred and I have been advocating for the Secretary of State is to get regulations put out for county election officials. Right now it sort of depends on the county for how they're verifying your signature. And you know, it is a human process where people are reviewing the signatures. So. Ideally, the Secretary of State, with some gentle prodding from voting rights advocates, is going to have emergency regulations in place for county election officials. You know, some counties do a good job, but it varies across the state. And there has been some good research done recently from the actually from students at Stanford Law School, you know, comparing signature verification rules statewide. You know, it does vary. And, you know, it's not a good thing to have things vary by county. You want there to be uniform rules. So we're hopeful to see those emergency regulations in place. Before November, but but it, to the back to the question though, it is a concern though. Like you don't want your signature to be mismatched and and have your ballot rejected. The county elections office is required to contact you to try to get to, to have a signature cure, but um, you know they're doing that by mail typically, and that's it, it could not work, and they might not get it in time. So you you really want to make sure that you've got a good signature on file with them. But but there is there is a second chance there, but but you know you don't you don't want to rely on second chances for your vote. But I've been the mark and the witness. Yeah, so the, but and I, I, the mark and witness rules are actually on the vote by mail ballot instructions. So you know you can sign with a mark and you can have a witness sign your your ballot for you. Mm -hmm. So can I ask the most basic question? Is every single signature checked? In all of the ballots? Yes. If you vote by mail. Yeah, if you vote by mail, they check every signature on every envelope in the state. Well, I kind of feel like this is a major issue that in itself like requires some education, maybe even just a whole like sheet, information sheet on ensuring that your signature matches for people with disabilities and without disabilities. To, if, that if you're going to vote by mail and you want your vote to count, that you should make sure your signature matches. It, it probably would be another go toolkit. We we have an older toolkit on you know if you're signing with a with a with a mark, mm -hmm. um, and we we have some advice. But you know, given especially the problems with the postal service mm -hmm. and the fact that the regulations for signature verifications are going to be emergency regulations, um, that, that they were delayed happening. So. Uh, you know, it's part of Fred Nice job, we do push to make sure that things are happening. So that's the squeaky wheel, the voting rights advocate. So it's good that those regulations are coming. Mm -hmm. um, and I did really like the research from the Stanford Law School. I, I liked his best practice. You know, they went and talked to the individual counties and really figured out how this happened. But there were a lot of ballots rejected in March. You know, some of those were rejected because they were late, but, but a good portion of those were rejected because either someone forgot to sign or the signatures were mismatched. Mm -hmm. So the counties, they are required to follow people that forget to sign and mismatch signatures, but you know, uh, how much junk mail do you, does it, people on this call throw out? A lot. So you might throw up, throw out that follow-up notice. No, I did a lot of people Yeah, it didn't get there on time. And, and I, I think probably a bigger thing on time is that it wasn't postmarked on time. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. And then, yeah, but, but you know, if 0.5% of ballots in a county are rejected right. and, and there's a million voters, here, that's a lot of voters. Mm -hmm. So um, even, even if it is a really, really small percentage, you know, you shouldn't have one vote not count, but but it's it's a big problem when you're getting that number of of, of people disenfranchised over over signature issues. So, right. 
Okay, well, th this is just even this one question has been so helpful for the information that we need to be sure that we're providing consistently as we're talking to people with disabilities, family members and professionals that, that um, you want to make sure your vote, your, your signature matches, you want to make sure you sign that mail in ballot because mm -hmm. these are like two really simple and basic things. Okay, thank you. All right, lots, lots more questions. Um, and just remind everybody, we're not going to have people speak. So raising your hand through the, the Zoom system is not going to get you your question asked. You should do it through the Q&A, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. It has two sort of chat bubbles next to it. Or if you, if you can't find that, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, one, uh, one of the attendees wanted to make the point that I'm sure you will agree with, Fred. Um, that it is so important that the person assisting the person with the disability does not make the choices of the voting for the person, but assists with getting the vote, the votes on the ballot. Um, and I know that we're going to do a whole uh, webinar on supported decision making in voting to ensure that people have the necessary information to make choices. Um, and that what it means to, to really empower someone to make their own choices, but I'm wondering if either of you want to comment on that. are trained for you know what the rules are that you know they they're not persuading people out about they're, they're just doing exactly what the person tells them to do so it is an option you know you, you can have a poll worker help you fill out a ballot so it, it is one not ideal because it's not private or independent but um you know it might be better than having your you know a loved one fill out and, and know how you voted it might be better to have a stranger who's required to keep it private and not interfere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, you know, one of the things that I always say when we talk about supported decision making and voting is that almost all of us need support in making decisions with voting. We use various people that we know and respect to help guide our voting, especially if it's on propositions or things that we are very, that we find to be very complicated and may have a difficulty understanding. I mean, we get so many judges on our ballots and it's like, I don't have time to sit and research the judges. And so I luckily am married to a lawyer who does all that research about all the different judges and I just vote the way he tells me to vote. Not because I'm not, I don't have my own decisions, but that it's like, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to take his. Some people take, they, they get, you know, maybe they belong to a trade union and the union has the people they endorse for candidates. All those things are okay. Um, and we all use that. Um, so, um, all right, we have so many more questions. This is just a quick follow up to the question about signing ballots. Somebody just wants to clarify, is a rubber stamp an, an acceptable signature? Uh, if you find it, it is, if you so 
the voting offices that we should do it that, that you could go and use a rubber stamp and you go directly to the ele elections office the registrar of the register there mm -hmm. and also you know just like if, you, if that's the stamp you use at the dmv when you got your driver's license that that's what the signature is going to look like that they have on file so well, let me just ask like one other, I'm like now becoming a little obsessed with this signature thing because it's like, because my son's signature can vary. Um, let's say we don't. I understand. Yeah, thank you. So in the non-COVID world, when we're actually voting in person, are those, and we go in and we sign our name on this in this book as we're entering, is are those signatures compared as well or just the mail-in ballot? No. Mail okay. Just right. mail ballot. Very helpful. I'm learning so much today from you all. No, no, why? Yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing makes sense. Don't ask you why. It definitely nothing. Yeah, so your signatures aren't, so when you go inside, like, the traditional way is you're signing the poll book, which is like the big book with all the lines and they, they find your address and you sign it. The new way in a lot of counties is they have electronic poll books and, you, and you're signing that on the screen. Mm -hmm. So those signatures aren't checked against your signature. They are. They are not. They're not. Okay. Yeah. Wait, yeah, it might not make sense. You know, I, uh, so it's always like you're signing because you're verifying that you haven't voted already right you're, like you're not so much verifying to prove that it's you maybe your face in person with the poll worker is, is enough yeah. you also don't have to have picture id in california to vote so i mean we've got got pretty good voter friendly standards in, in california unless it's your first time unless you register like for example you registered to vote online and it's your first time voting then you're going to need to bring a, so there, and there's a list of form of ids that are acceptable that you can bring to verify that it's you yeah um, so I have a question that, that I've been thinking about, and that is, um, when you vote, um, when you, when you receive, I, I know before, now everybody's getting a mail-in ballot, but before, if you registered for an absentee ballot or a mail ballot, and you decide on the day of the election, I'd rather vote in person, you bring your mail-in ballot, um, and the and then they destroy it and they give you a ballot to vote in person. Um, now that a hundred percent of California voters are receiving a mail-in ballot, if they show up, if they decide I'm going to go in person and they show up the polls, they have to bring their mail-in ballot um, in order to turn that in. If they forget their mail-in ballot, then they're provisional, correct? Their ballot yeah. their vote is yeah. provisional. Can you talk to me about what you think are going to be the implications of that in this election? That so many that means that a hundred percent of voters who vote in person are required to bring in their mail-in ballot and turn it in. Is that, it, would you interpret it that way? So they're not required to bring in their vote by mail ballot. It would mm -hmm. probably be a best practice to bring it with you okay. because if you don't have your ballot, you're going to have to vote provisionally. Basically, yeah. what that means is. When the county goes back, they're going to check that you didn't turn in your vote by mail ballot and your provisional vote in person is going to count. So don't be afraid of provisional voting. However, some counties are going to be able to look you up in real time when you're checking in. Like, for example, if they have an electronic poll book, they'll be able to see that they have, you have not submitted your vote by mail ballot. So they will count your in-person vote. And then you're not allowed to vote by mail. And if for some reason a vote by mail ballot came in later, they've already credited you as voting in person. So, so there's no chance of you double voting, but it, it varies by county if they're gonna have that, that technology. So it's probably a best practice to bring your blank vote by mail ballot with you and surrender it. Yeah. Um, and then that could also be, let's say they're like what happened earlier, they had their e-poll books went down in March. So it's probably a best practice to bring that thing with you and then also just to make sure you don't vote in person and then forget, you know, it's because, so anyway, you just want to be careful with that. I, I don't think there's a risk of people double voting or anything. There are really good safeguards in place to prevent that. Not to mention that it's illegal and, you know, there's, there's penalties for doing so. So, um, but 
I, I guess the way to answer your question, Judy, is you probably should bring your unvoted vote by mail ballot with you when you go vote in person, but you don't have to if you lost it, for example. Okay, um, here's a question from Chris. You mentioned early in the presentation that in California, all registered active voters will be sent a mail-in ballot. What is the definition of an active voter? This is four, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's if you voted within the last four years, right, Fred? That's what an active voter is. The last four statewide elections. Yeah, the last four statewide elections. So basically back six years, if you voted, you're considered an active voter. So, I mean, if the last time you voted was 2008, you know, hint, hint, or, you know, last time you voted was 2004, or if you can't remember what the last time you voted was, you you need to make sure you're properly registered because you're not going to get a vote by mail ballot automatically. If you did show up at the polling location, you're probably still going to be on the rolls and you'd be able to do conditional voter registration, but that's not ideal. So, uh, conditional voting is not ideal. I Yeah, so and it's easy. You can go on the Secretary of State's website and the voter registration portal, it's accessible, it's easy to use. The website's pretty good. You can do it on your smartphone. And what information do they ask you when you go to check in for your registration? Just to check to see if you've you registered? Yeah, they... The ID number. So that was me. The address and the ID number. ID number? Is that what you're Are they looking up your ID number? I thought they were just looking up your name and address when you're checking in in person. You have to have the ID over right. You have to have an ID number or social security on file. But for voters that are have voted like unless you're a new registration you know they're not going to check some form of identification to make sure it's you so well, so so here's my question could any like if you have if you know someone's name and address can you check to see if they're registered to vote if you, if you don't need an id you just need their name and address you know if you're going to look them up on the secretary of state's website you have to know their um their id number their social security number so you can't okay. just look up anyone okay got it to that point, too, your the voter registration data is just just to answer, just in case anyone's wondering. So the Secretary of State has data on voter registration, mm -hmm. campaigns, scholars, researchers. For a good reason, you can you can get the voter registration data, mm -hmm. which you know which has names, addresses, you know, political party, political party, um, you know whether how recently you voted. It doesn't say what you voted for. Mm -hmm. So. Political campaign, they can get that data, but generally it, it's, it's not public data. Like you can only get it if you have a good reason to need or a valid reason for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you couldn't look up someone that you don't know on the voter register. You couldn't look them up online because you, you wouldn't have their social or their driver's license number. Got it. So people have been asking, will you, will we make our slides available? Um, I, I'm sure if Paul and Fred, you could email me um, this PowerPoint presentation, we'll be happy to get it up on the Disability Vote California website. Yeah. Um, and it's probably available somewhere. Um, a lot of people are looking for a couple of things specifically where the links are of, of these. So that should be in the PowerPoint once it, we get it up there, right? The links are in the PowerPoint. Also, like if you don't want to wait, the, the easiest way to find is if you go to Disability Rights California's website in our publications page, you can click on the voting tab and that has a link to all of our voting publications. Mm -hmm. The only one that's probably not in there is the Center for Inclusive Democracy. I, I referenced their um, voting location citing tool. So um, maybe you could put that in the chat. I can put that in the chat. Yeah. Great. Um, they also, people are also interested in the hotline number. If you could put that in the chat as well. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll put both in there right now. Perfect.
and we'll be sure to put that on the website as well. Um, all right, we're, the signature thing is a lot of questions. Um, what if a voter can't sign at all? In the past, um, this is a parent who's printed unable to sign due to disability for her son. Do you see this as a problem? Do a mark. Use a mark. Is that, is that what you said, Fred? Yeah, yeah. A, mark. So a mark could be an X. Yeah. Um, and then okay, thank you. It had to be witnessed. Yeah, yeah, you you witness it and then you you sign the, the vote by mail, the witness signs and the mm -hmm. uh, to, to verify that the mark is the mark of the voter. And that's on the ballot, that witness line? Yeah, the, the instructions are written on the envelope. It's really tiny font, but the instructions are on there. Okay, all right. Basically, you're, you're, you sign somewhere, the, the witness signs somewhere on the envelope that the mark is the mark of the voter. Yeah, got it. Um, how can we, how, how, this is from Stephen Hinkle, self-advocate who's on our board. Um, how can we get assistance staff um, at group homes and supported living environments to recognize the opinion of a disabled voter, even if they have a different political opinion than staff of the facility? What security measures should be taken to not pressure a disabled voter for voting a certain way for the staff's interests? That's, that's an interesting question. Yes. staff training um yeah so that that doesn't have have you heard a lot about staff training on voting and supported decision making in group no, homes no, no. no doesn't happen so maybe part of our what one of the things we have to do with our coalition is really develop some materials and some training um that hopefully a lot of group home providers will encourage staff to take so that is a really excellent point. Um, so at this point, I don't see any more questions. Um, I just want to give our other panelists, Fernando, Howard, a chance if you have any questions that you wanted to provide uh, to Fred or to Paul. I'm not sure if you do. Fernando, I, don't, you move? I don't want to say, Judy, I don't want to say, first of all, thank you for letting for letting me be on this um, webinar. I really, I really, I really enjoyed your boy what I said about, you know, your voice at your vote and that it, 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 our responsibility, what kind of a country we grew up in, wherever we grew up in a country that is compassionate and caring, or, com, or a society that is um, authoritarian and cruel. And we simply cannot let it go the other way. We just can't. And we cannot survive in a country which is not democratic and which is not inclusive and which does not respect our rights. And that is what I had to say. And I hope people take that to heart because it really is true. This election is not just about Democrat and Republican, it is about what kind of country we're going to be. I agree. Thank you, Howard. Fernando, did you want to ask any questions or make any closing remarks? Uh, just echoing uh, what Howard Chase uh, just shared with us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to to share my perspective, that of my families, and really, once again, I want to reiterate the the importance of, and the urgency behind this coming election. It's really, I think, one of the most important that I can ever remember. Um, and it doesn't matter how you vote; it matters that you vote. And the fact is, is that that's the only way that not only are we gonna have the right officials representing what we need in Sacramento, but have the right situations presented so that eventually the law and the policies and, and that, that we have available to our children can be put in place. So however which way, hold me accountable, I will vote and I will bring 10 other people to vote 
I'm holding each and every one of you who's listening to this Zoom to vote and bring 10 others as well. And Paul and Fred, uh, thank you especially for this amazing and very informative information. I learned a lot and things that I didn't know that I think will definitely help us. Of course, Judy, likewise to you. For Thanks for having us. Hey. So thank you both. Thank you to all of our presenters, Paul and Fred, especially for, I mean, I learned a lot too, and I thought I knew a lot about voting, and apparently I did not. So, um, so thank you to both of you. Thank you, Fernando, Howard, and Kristen. Um, thank you to our interpreter, Lorna, and to Ed, our program assistant. Um, we, we will have another webinar next week. I'm not exactly sure what the topic is yet, but we'll get the announcement out. And um, once again, if you would like to join our coalition, you can put your name and organization. Oh, wait, we have one more question that just came in. Oh, thank you all. It was a thank you all. Thank you, thank you Cliff. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Take care and be safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.